Good afternoon, my name is Juana Andrea Rusciano and I am a PhD student at Transylvania University of Brasov. My paper is entitled A Brain Computer Interface for Controlling a Mobile Device by Using the NeuroSky EEG Headset and Raspberry Pi. I am the single author of this paper, but the main ideas were discussed with my favorite coordinate, Professor Dr. Engineer Marius Cristian Luculescu, who had an essential impact on my academic development. The structure of this presentation is the following. One, introduction. Two, hardware system, NeuroSky MindWave and Raspberry Pi. Three, a software system, Python application. Four, the Python application running on the computer level. Five, the Python application running on the Raspberry Pi. Six, results. Seven, discussions. And eight, conclusions. Introduction. The brain-computer interface, or BCI, focuses mainly on providing support for people with neuromotor disabilities. Employing neuronal biopotentials, thanks to different techniques and leveraging signal processing methods and artificial intelligence algorithms, led to the inception of brain-computer interfaces capable of translating thoughts into actions. The brain-computer interface encounters several difficult difficulties related to variable cognitive abilities, massive data, dimensions, instantaneous time response, real-time processing, and complex detection of a specific neuronal pattern. The BCI comprises advanced systems in specialized research laboratories and portable, simple, quick experimental devices designed for affordable home use. Among the most spread fundamental BCI application is the mobile robot controlling by using the voluntary eye-blinking biosignal. According to previous studies, portable EEG headsets were preferable to robust EEG acquisition systems to increase the setup and programming convenience. Then, to implement and control a mechatronic assistive device in a straightforward manner, microcontroller-based multifunctional boards proved to be advantages. Nevertheless, significant challenges arise from optimized integration between hardware components and software modules to develop an innovative assistive application that is simple to use, reliable, and accurate for people with neuromotor disabilities. This paper proposes an original Python application for controlling a Raspberry Pi-based assistive robot by using the voluntary eye blinking detected across the raw EEG signal from the NeuroSky biosensor. In contrast to most previous BCI projects involving EEG processing only by Raspberry Pi to detect voluntary eye blinking, the current work provides improved accuracy by analyzing the raw EEG signal on the computer and implementing a novel Python algorithm to capture the exact moment of performing the eye blinking. Accordingly, it resulted in the achievement of the new Python solution for enabling WebSockets-based wireless communication between the Windows computer and the Raspberry Pi. The commands determined by voluntary eye blinks for controlling the mobile robot are smooth, rapid, and reliable. Hardware system, NeuroSky MindWave and Raspberry Pi. The proposed VCA prototype is based on the following systems. The NeuroSky MindWave Mobile second edition EEG portable headset, the Raspberry Pi model B for gigabyte, and the necessary components to build a mobile robot. NeuroSky headset is an improved version of the portable ThinkGear chip initially released in 2011. It offers several benefits for both developers and users. Low price, easy setup, embedded filters and amplifiers, Bluetooth connectivity, code examples in different programming languages, comfortable wearing, raw EEG acquisition, and e-sense meters such as attention and meditation level or eye blinking strength. And the Raspberry Pi is a single board computer embedding high performance functionalities, wireless local area network, Bluetooth 5.0, video or audio output, quad core processor of 1.5 gigahertz and 40 general purpose input output pins. The current work uh, implies constructing a mobile robot Uh, the current work implies constructing a mobile robot composed of a compact chassis, two direct control motors, two rechargeable batteries, a servo motor for switching movement direction, and a driver based on a dual-edge bridge. A software system, Python implementation. 
The software system of the proposed BCI prototype consists of two primary levels. The computer level, Python implementation of the raw EEG analysis for voluntary eye blinking detection, and the Raspberry Pi level, Python coding, of the movement commands used to control the mobile robot. The Python application running on the computer level. The computer level comprises a new approach to optimize voluntary eye blinking detection. The NeuroSky chip transmits data to a computer by using Bluetooth protocol. Then the acquired raw EEG signal is analyzed by the Python application running on the computer. After that, the corresponding command is sent to the Raspberry Pi using WebSockets protocol after counting the voluntary eye blinks. The WebSockets protocol successfully enables wireless communication between the two primary levels. Thus, the Raspberry Pi controls the mobile robot by setting the proper movement direction, forward, backward, left, or right. The figure shows the workflow of the Python program running on the computer in the spider development environment. The first stage, supposed importing of the necessary Python libraries, NeuroPy for EEG data acquisition from NeuroSky Biosensor, Tkinter for creating graphical user interfaces, Matplotlib for graphical displaying the time amplitude variance of the raw EEG signal, NumPy for working with multidimensional arrays, and SciPy for calculating statistical metric. The second stage is essential because it contains the code instructions enabling the WebSockets based wireless data exchange between the computer and Raspberry Pi, and both of them should be connected to the same network area. Therefore, the IP address received by, by Raspberry Pi should be used in the Python program running on the computer. The Raspberry Pi accomplishes the role of the server while the computer is the client. The third stage involves adding the settings for proper communication between the computer and NeuroSky, such as the COM port and the number of samples per second, and enabling the optimized voluntary eye blinks detection algorithm by setting the previously stored samples and the number of the current recording samples. The fourth stage is related to the real-time EEG data acquisition and voluntary eye blinks counting. Thus, the main algorithm is based on the following steps. Reading one raw EEG value, storing each value to an array, waiting for a predefined time interval, two or 10 milliseconds, and incrementing the number of current recording, recorded samples. A setting time interval to a setting time interval to two milliseconds results in acquiring 512 raw EEG samples during one second. Setting time interval to 10 milliseconds results in acquiring 100 raw EEG samples during one second. It should be emphasized that it is challenging to get waiting time of two milliseconds in Windows-based computers. The time resolution response of the Windows operating systems is, a standard, is standardized to a value between 10 and 25 milliseconds. Also, using particular programs should be possible to adjust the Windows time resolution response. The fifth stage implies comparing each acquired raw EEG value to a predefined maximum amplitude that should be set to a user customized value before running the Python program. Python executes section A of code instructions if the acquired raw EEG value exceeds the amplitude threshold. Otherwise, if the acquired raw EEG value is lower than the, than the amplitude, Python executes section B of codes. The figure shows uh, the workflow of the first uh, sequence included by section A of Python code. The initial phase checks if the number of current recorded EEG samples is greater than or equal to the number of previously stored EEG samples. Accomplishing this uh, condition involves removing as many uh, samples as equal to the difference between current and previous acquired samples until getting the raw EEG value greater than the predefined maximum amplitude. Then, the main array is reorganized to store only the previous recorded samples whose number was initially predefined. Avoiding the above stated condition results in getting a lower number of currently recorded samples than the number of the previously stored samples at the moment when a specific amplitude value exceeded the established thresholds. Therefore, it defines a new array it defines a new array by setting to zero all its samples whose number is equal to the difference between previous and current acquired EEG samples. 
then the array is reorganized to store both these first elements set to zero and the previously recorded samples until exceeding the maximum amplitude. After handling the above described condition, the current number of acquired samples is assigned to the value of the previous number of stored samples. The figure shows the workflow of the second sequence included by section A of Python code. This sequence checks if the current recorded sample should be lower than the initially set number of maximum acquired samples. Averaging the 512 or 100 values calculates the arithmetic mean based on the A array. The arithmetic mean is a simple measurement able to identify if a voluntary eye blink was performed or not. Therefore, checking the mean value between a maximum, yes? Uh, therefore, checking the mean value between a minimum and a maximum threshold results in detecting an intentional eye blink. Each positive response to this condition is equivalent to a voluntary eye blink occurrence, and the corresponding counter gets incremented. Further, the same steps described above are executed. The figure shows the workflow of section B of Python code implemented on the computer level in spider environment. The section B is mainly aimed at handling the situation given by achieving the two conditions. One, the number of the current recorded samples should be equal to the number of the, of the initially set maximum acquired samples. And two, the latest recorded EEG value should be lower than the predefined maximum value. If both conditions are accomplished, then it follows the displaying and checking of the counter value. The Python application running on the Raspberry Pi. The first stage consists in importing the necessary Python libraries, RPIO, GPIO, for controlling the general purpose input output pins of Raspberry. Battle is a micro framework for web applications. Time for adding delays of or waiting intervals. Socket for sending messages across a low level network and threading for concurrent running some code instructions. Uh, the second phase is supposed to set up the Broadcom GPIO pins numbering mode. After assigning proper values to them, all the pins for changing the movement direction and adjusting the speed of the left and right side direct control matters. For safety reasons, by changing the duty cycle of the matters, a low movement speed was set for controlling the mobile robot by using voluntary eye blinks. The third phase is related to enable web sockets based wireless communication between Raspberry Pi and the computer. The same settings for the required parameters, header, port server address should be set for Python applications running on the computer and the Raspberry Pi connected to the same network. Also, a function should be defined for enabling the server to listen for new threads or network clients. The last phase allows receiving and checking the network messages. Results. This paper proposes an experimental prototype based on a brain-computer interface that is helpful for people with neuromotor disabilities to test and get familiar with this technology. The two video demonstrations of the initial experimentation based on a different Python-based approach, but by turning on and off different LEDs and the real-time running of the Python BCI proposed system are available to these two unlisted YouTube links. Discussions. Voluntary eye blinking constitutes a precise and straightforward control signal necessary to command the presented mobile assistive robot. The time response is approximately equal to one second and can be impacted by graphically displaying of the time domain of the acquired raw EEG signal. Depending on the computer performance, an array containing 100 or 512 raw EEG samples is analyzed by a customized algorithm for detecting the voluntary eye blinking pattern. Among the limitations of the current Python-based brain-computer interface implementation, before running the computer application, it is necessary to set user profile customized thresholds for maximum amplitude of the raw EEG signal and the arithmetical mean of the acquired array of raw EEG values. Nevertheless, the proposed BCI application for controlling the mobile robot provides the following benefits code instructions entirely implemented in Python programming language, smooth wireless communication based on web sockets between computer and Raspberry Pi, and the use of the most portable and inexpensive EEG headset and 
an optimized algorithm to detect the exact real-time moment when a voluntary eye blink is executed. Conclusions. This paper proposes a brain-computer interface experimental system based on integrating the NeuroSky portable EEG headset and the Raspberry Pi board for controlling a mobile robot by implementing two new Python applications. Regarding the novelty of the proposed uh, BCI solution, an improved algorithm for voluntary eye blinking detection and WebSockets based wireless communication between the computer and Raspberry Pi were implemented in the Python open source programming language. As a future research direction, an improved compact hardware design is still necessary for building the mobile robot by using an expansion board to both control the motors and power the Raspberry Pi board. In addition, an improved software framework should automatically adjust the motor speed, avoid obstacles, and offer intuitive feedback for voluntary eye blinks execution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Victoria Pescurte. I'm coming from the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care of the local uh, University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Chisinau, Moldova. Uh, in fact, I'm an uh, anesthesiologist um, that uh, is being passionate uh, about data science, uh, machine learning and related fields and uh, even is trying to use the advances uh, of these fields for clinical purpose. And because I have pre-recorded uh, my uh, presentation, uh, I will uh, play the presentation, meanwhile, uh, getting ready uh, for questions. As you may have already inferred from the title, my presentation will focus on signal processing, but let's uh, find out what is meant by a less traditional approach to this task. Here on the screen, and I will start with some triviality, uh, you can see a number of uh, traces as well as some numerical parameters. In fact, uh, these are multimodal time series representing physiological parameters that are routinely monitored in an intensive care unit. What can we do with this uh, data? First of all, we can visualize it and use for uh, diagnosis and treatment. Second, uh, can be using this data for more complex tests, like for instance, machine learning, uh, but with the same goal, uh, computer assisted decisions. For this, we will need to extract features for, from the data to obtain shared representation and finally uh, pass this uh, transformed data to a machine learning algorithm. In the framework of this research, uh, we are building a yearly sepsis prediction system. By yearly, uh, I mean uh, four hours, at least four hours before sepsis uh, can be confirmed using regular clinical tools. The current research uh, uses uh, data coming from a 2019 challenge, yearly prediction of sepsis from clinical data, that uh, comprises uh, over 40,000 clinical cases, set A and set B, coming from two uh, distinct US hospitals, uh, this uh, data uh, include uh, 40 parameters uh, like vital science, laboratory indices, etc., 1.5 million time windows and over uh, 10 million data points. And uh, as the set A contains uh, much less missing data, it was selected for further processing. Here we can see the appearance of this data, but what really counts is uh, selecting the data with the highest discriminatory uh, properties uh, in order to uh, build uh, subsequently the uh, machine learning system. Uh, experimenting with different sets of uh, data, uh, parameters, different parameters, we uh, came to uh, a final set of parameters that are presented on the screen, including heart rate, oxygen saturation, systolic blood pressure, diastolic pressure, respiratory rate, and temperature. 
Uh, speaking about tools we are using for this, uh, they can be grouped as per the screen, first of all, uh, coming from the R programming language, including Shiny package for building web applications, uh, H2O platform for machine learning, all from language for, for some verification aspects, and finally, Python programming environment, including H2O Wave, a recent uh, package, for building uh, the final version of the application for the clinical use. Speaking about transforming or preparing the data for machine learning, uh, we are using a quite uh, unusual uh, method, uh, like block decomposition method, as the technique for extracting features from raw data. Uh, this uh, method comes from the uh, field of algorithmic information dynamics, uh, which is an emerging field of complexity science based on uh, algorithmic information theory and uh, particularly on the concept of kolmogorov chaitin complexity. Here on the screen in the middle we have the uh, mathematical representation of this uh, approach uh, where by uh, kt is the complexity of the string s that is the length of the shortest program p that outputs the string s running on an universal Turing machine. Uh, more, uh, BDM as a method is the core of a special tool for providing reliable estimations to uncomputable functions, namely the online algorithmic uh, complexity calculator that can be accessed using the address on the screen. At the bottom of the screen you have uh, one of the papers uh, where these aspects are described in details. Speaking about block decomposition method, you can see the mathematical representation of this method and as you can see it is based on the coding theorem method uh, by which we can uh, calculate the complexity of small blocks and for this method we are dividing a larger object in small blocks, calculating complexity of these blocks and summing these complexities, uh, unique values first of all, and the logarithmic representation of the repeated values, we will get uh, the final value of the complexity of this large object. <clears throat> Just to illustrate, using a jokey image, a self-operating napkin, uh, which in fact uh, is a quite sophisticated machinery, but uh, useless machinery, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we can uh, divide all this machinery into smaller blocks, calculating the complexity of these separate blocks, and finally summing uh, the results, and we will get the overall complexity of the uh, whole machinery. <clears throat> data pro uh, processing using BDM uh, supposes uh, preparing the data in a special manner. First of all, original da data needs to be uh, reshaped in 3x3 three three matrices with physiological parameter values as per the screen, where rows are uh, for uh, parameters and uh, columns for parameters values in three subsequent samples. Then we will uh, binarize this data using the uh, as threshold, the mean uh, value per row. And finally, using the calculator, we, we can uh, estimate the uh, algorithmic complexity of such a matrix that uh, represent or encodes the conditions of a certain uh, body uh, system or function. And we also uh, need the difference of uh, respective parameters value between two consecutive hours for three hours to come finally to uh, the vectors that or the vector that will be provided to the machine learning algorithm. As you can see, we have here a 14 uh, element vector with uh, two uh, cells for uh, the complexity and V1 to V12 uh, for the difference of the six uh, parameters. And all this uh, looks uh, in the uh, final format, like on the screen, where we have an additional uh, column for uh, labeling the samples, zero for sepsis and uh, for non-sepsis uh, samples and one for sepsis samples. Uh, and our final uh, set used for machine learning consists uh, of uh, 
the training set with 5,157 samples as well as the test set with 909 samples. Uh, this uh, set is, uh, had been passed to a number of algorithms. Uh, the best one proved to be the machine uh, boost, uh, gradient boosting machine. Uh, and uh, here on the screen we have the performance of this uh, model uh, by the area under the curve and you can notice that it is uh, slightly over 92%. The same uh, metric uh, slightly uh, presented in slightly a different uh, format, the confusion matrix plot. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to mention that at the very beginning uh, we have replicated one of the state of the art uh, systems in this field for sepsis prediction, uh, namely inside uh, system. We replicated it in our language and later one used as a benchmark while building uh, our own uh, system. Uh, here you can see the uh, performance uh, metric uh, for these two systems and uh, it, it uh, can be uh, is evident that they are uh, quite close. The difference is in recall, where our system is two percent uh, better, and specificity, uh, where our system is one percent uh, lower. Uh, and now I will uh, switch to another screen and uh, show you uh, an application, a practical application. In fact, is a demo uh, version of this uh, application. Uh, we. Uh, for um, exemplifying uh, what we can um, do uh, with uh, this uh, data uh, prepared in su such a way. Okay, let's uh, look at the application. Uh, I would like you uh, to take a look at the uh, center, uh, upper part of the screen, where we have an Excel-like uh, uh, table, uh, where uh, we have the six parameters of interest. And in fact, a doctor or a nurse will need uh, to input uh, every hour uh, the uh, value of these uh, parameters. Let's uh, do it uh, right uh, away. Uh, heart rate, for instance, 87, uh, saturation uh, 98, temperature 38, uh, systolic blood pressure 115, uh, diastolic blood pressure uh, 70 and respiratory rate 28. Uh, we will need to input uh, for three times uh, at, at least, for three consecutive uh, hours. For this we uh, can add uh, for the future uh, inputs additional rows. It's done quite easily. Uh, and once we have such three uh, uh, rows with data, we can ask the system to uh, estimate uh, the risk. But what else we can do with this uh, uh, application? Here we have a list of pre-selected cases uh, and I will be using one of them, is a real patient, and we can um, display the data of this patient uh, where the uh, um, columns are uh, four parameters and the rows denoting uh, all the observations. We also can visualize this data as plots and you can see that our patient uh, is for the uh, seven hours already in the intensive care uh, unit and uh, finally we can uh, process the data and get prognosis. Uh, the prognosis will be for the last observation and in this case is a high uh, sepsis uh, risk uh, and we also can uh, estimate uh, and plot the uh, dynamic of uh, this prognosis uh, during the patient's stay in the intensive care unit and let's do it uh, right now dynamic prognosis and plotting this uh, prognosis looks like on the screen at the bottom uh, you can see that at the beginning the patient had a low risk zero risk and all of a sudden uh, it became a high uh, risk um, it means that uh, starting this point in time only uh, after four uh, or around four hours uh, regular clinical tools will be able to confirm the diagnosis we can uh, not wait uh, so long and uh, we will need to start the antibiotic therapy uh, according to uh, uh, this uh, data we are getting from the uh, application.
Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Uh, let me uh, switch to an another screen just uh, to continue. Just a moment. Okay, I hope you can see my uh, uh, new screen. Do you? Yes. Good, thank you. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, once again, what uh, is meant here by less traditional? Uh, this is uh, using Kolmogorov complexity as a method of encoding the state of uh, body system or function, and as well as a technique for data processing and data representation. I uh, exemplified uh, this by uh, my presentation. And uh, the final goal of all this uh, activity is building up a system for yearly sepsis prediction for clinical use. We are uh, at the moment uh, at the uh, beginning uh, stage of this uh, journey. And uh, now maybe uh, there are questions. Uh, my name is Michael Shishkin from Kharkiv University, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and I'd like to introduce two works uh, that make a solution for describing processes in the human heart in the case when an arrhythmia attack has occurred. If you allow me, I would do a general introduction, introduction for both of the articles that I'm going to present because they concern similar areas, but use different methods for it. Uh, and instead, uh, the preamble, I'd like to remind some key facts about cardiovascular diseases. You can see this on page one. Only two numbers here are. 70.8 million deaths and 85% uh, uh, of these are due to heart attacks and strokes. But it frequently happens due to atrial fibrillation concept. But by the way, atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke by six times and risk of the heart attack by two times. Uh, statistics, uh, uh, statistics about atrial fibrillation, you can see on the second page, and uh, it's a really huge number and awful case in the world, awful uh, cases in the world uh, with this type of arrhythmia. Uh, research in the field of analysis of electrical activity of the heart has been carried out all over the world for more than a dozen years. Uh, and uh, it would seem almost all processes of formation, distribution, influence of cardiac action potential have been sufficiently studied to synchronize the work of such complex object as a heart. But the main cause of death is still diseases of the cardiovascular system. That is, despite uh, the anatomical, biological, medical study of the principles of the functioning of the heart. And uh, I think that this uh, list could contain a lot of screens. And since still faces difficulties in early diagnosis and even more so in predicting pathological changes in the heart. There are a number of reasons for this uh, in particular, uh, mm, uh, the need for constant monitoring of cardiac activity, the complexity of extracting and predicting the electrical signal of the heart during such monitoring, the interpretation of the data obtained in real time, and the time and notification of the doctor of what about the accumulation of things uh, that indicating the occurrence of changes in cardiovascular system that are dangerous to health. Uh, if we consider the methods of obtaining and interpreting uh, the signal of electrical acti activity of heart, then practically is only method is ECG, uh, well, and its various modifications. And uh, Holter monitoring also is still the gold standard in the field of continuous cardiac signal monitoring. However, the methods of 
conducting both LHG and Holter studies are an applicable on inapplicable for obtaining long-term data between more than 72 hours, especially those obtained and processed online. The way out of this situation could be not obtaining a complete ECG and its processing, but using the implementation inherent in the heart rhythm. Unfortunately, uh, at the moment, there is no sufficiently reliable, reliable method to obtain additional and essential information about the processes occurring in the heart in terms of reading. Uh, and uh, the authors try to statistically substantiate this possibility based on the event description of the reading. So, uh, any rhythmogram can be interpreted uh, in two ways, as a sequence of random durations of heart contraction in the time. In this case, the duration of RR inter interval can be considered a random continuous variable for such a process. And B, as a stream of random events inside the cardiac conduction system, uh, the result of which is the contraction of the ventricles uh, that airwaves uh, of electric, we can see the airwaves of the electric radiogram. A random discrete value of such a stream of events can be conventionally considered as the heart rate average or the fixed time interval. Both variants of this presentation of the rhythmogram allow considering its probabilistic properties using either distribution rules uh, for continuous or discrete random variable. Uh, if we option A, this uh, you can see on the page five, uh, uh, then it should be noted that full information about the pro probabilistic pro properties, uh, properties of random process is carried by the probability distribution probability distribution uh, uh, fx of the random variable x. Such a probability distribution in general case can be represented in the form of inverse Fourier transform of the characteristic function theta of the random variable. In turn, theta can be represented uh, as n infinite series whose elements linearly depend on the initial moments alpha. Uh, on the other hand, the initial modes can be expressed in terms of centered standard numerical char characteristics like central moments or cumulants. From system of expression, the initial moments. Do you see my presentation well? Sorry. Yes, yes, I see your presentation, yes. Because I blink in my uh, monitor. Uh, oh, on the other hand, the initial moments can be expressed in terms of central standard numerical characteristics. From system of expression that the, in, that the initial moments and combinations of above standard characteristics like mean, variance, asymmetry, and cortisis coefficient. When uh, using the discrete model, uh, this page six, uh, it's convenient to study an informative parameter about changes in the properties of the stream of random events uh, as a connectivity coefficient. Uh, it equals the ratio of the square of the mean value to the variance, a rare interval in the sliding observation window. Here we can see the dependence of connectivity coefficients uh, are, are uh, of the interval for uh, two alternative cardio states. S0 is normal rhythms, rhythm and S1 uh, in case uh, when atrial fibrillation onset. Uh, figure, figures five and six will illustrate the significant variability of the used numerical characteristics 
when changing the cardiac state. It should be known that such variability is characterized by important diagnostic properties. Uh, like a change in cardiac space entails a change in all without exception numerical characteristics, which indicates a change in the probabilistic model when the cardiac uh, state changes. And then science option B uh, uses a complex indicator like connectivity coefficient that depends on the mean variance and the interaction. Uh, it is more visual and informatively uh, preferable for constructing uh, a probabilistic model of the dynamic of electrical activity of the heart. Analyzing of, analyzing of variance was carried out to assess the significance of these characteristics and their interaction. Uh, this slide shows us uh, results of one factor uh, analysis of variants uh, named ANOVA for the results of each of the rhythmogram areas uh, at the level of significance uh, alpha equals 0.05, made it possible to calculate Fisher's criterion statistics with degrees of freedom numbers 5 and 194 for each of the studied variants of cardiac state. Results of Calculation of pages on seven uh, mm, and means the following. The rhythmogram, regardless of cardiac state, uh, is a non-stationarity in terms of mean value, a random process. And uh, non-stationarity for the normal rhythm state is much higher than for the atrial fibrillation state. Uh, here uh, we can see also uh, after correlation analysis for both states uh, allow us to draw the following con conclusions. Regardless of the type of cardiac state, the rhythmogram uh, is an ergodic process. And after correlation function for the normal uh, sinus rhythm is wider than uh, for the atrial fibrillation. Uh, this means that the spectra of the rhythmogram for normal and atrial fibrillation uh, states have different width. Uh, the minimum uh, allowable observation width should not be less, in this case, uh, should not be less than uh, 200 points, which provides an after correlation level uh, not exceeding uh, 0 0.2. Next. Next page is the result of two-factor analysis, correlation analysis. If you can see, uh, you can see initial table and the result of Fisher statistics calculation. Mm. Main result of this calculation is uh, to find uh, maximal, uh, maximal informative parameter for detective uh, uh, cardio state and uh, uh, you can see that this parameter is the connectivity coefficient uh, uh, table on the bottom of the screen. And, uh, at, and finally, conclusions. Uh, most of all, the factor cardiac state affects the coefficient of connectivity. Science is a statistic is maximal. Uh, it goes uh, almost... Uh, 36. Uh, F factor has a lesser effect of the rest of numerical characteristics. And for the mean variance and uh, asymmetric coefficient, the factor influence is statistically significant. There, if the statistics are higher than the critical value. And third, in fact, the space of informative parameters for the information of the procedure for recognizing an atrial fibrillation attack includes four basic uh, parameters listed in descending order of their diagnostic properties. They are a connectivity coefficient first, and then mean variance and asymmetry coefficient. That's all. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much for our presentation. Questions from audience, please? 
Ok. Domnul, ia pe scurt, vă rog. Uh, well, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, Mihailo for uh, the very interesting uh, presentation, especially uh, the parameters okay. uh, that uh, he derived from raw data that can help uh, in uh, finding out what is really happening with the patient. Uh, my question is, uh, have you tried to use machine learning Uh, applied to your data or to your rhythmograms? I got your uh, questions. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, machine learning is very interesting uh, method for adopting this algorithm and uh, increase, uh, uh, increase level of significance of this, uh, uh, this method. Uh, but uh, Uh, machine learning is the next stage uh, of our uh, uh, of our research, and uh, today we try to find uh, uh, great uh, professionals for uh, have uh, uh, practice with this uh, part of science. Uh, maybe uh, our cooperation. Uh, with uh, uh, computer mathematics department. Uh, next work, uh, I will be present uh, both uh, our department and computer mathematics uh, take to help uh, us to this machine learning algorithm. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, I wish you success in this direction. I hope. Thank you very much. Uh, my second wo uh, work concerns the study of the asymmetry of the heart rhythm in various conditions of the heart, namely the study of the uh, asymmetry of the speed spot plots in a four quadrant representation for atrial fibrillation arrhythmias. Uh, as you know, uh, the analysis of heart rate often comes down to the study of its variability. There is sufficient number of works that reveal uh, the effect of the heart rate of the sympathetic or parasympathetic branches of the nervous system. Uh, one uh, of the graphical methods uh, for studying uh, heart rate variability Uh, is the method of scatterography or, this, or the study of Poincare spots, of Poincare plots. We proposed a method that we call speed spot uh, and which allow not only the heart rate really to be displayed on the graph, but also the rate of its change. Slide two shows a comparison of Poincare plot and speed spot. So one correct plot, as you know, is a chart in which uh, each RR interval is plotted as a function of the previous RR interval, where the values of each pair of consecutive RR intervals are plotted on the point of the graph. This is the uh, left uh, side of this presentation. <clears throat> Uh, the essence of the speed spots visualization method is that the coordinate uh, of the state point in the orthogonal coordinate plane is formed as the current value of the RR interval. This is X coordinate. And the value of the rate of change in the duration or RR intervals near the current value of RR. Uh, DRR, it's, this is a uh, Y coordinate. Uh, clues uh, formed by the set of such points, both in Poincare plots and the proposed method, are characterized by SD1 and SD2 descriptors, uh, calculated as uh, the length of the ellipse axis. axis uh, that uh, enrolled uh, this cloud. 
moreover, maybe additional uh, descriptor is D12, that as the ratio of the first two. Uh, as can be seen from this uh, expression for mm -hmm. the speed spot, these descriptors are calculated as the uh, standard deviation of corresponding variable. Variable slide three shows images of three of spots for two states: normal rhythm uh, and adult fibrillation state. You can see a significant change in the graph, and accordingly, the main descriptors that characterize them. The same uh, can be observed in the graph of behavior or descriptors over time. It should be known that, that is during the atrial fibrillation process, the Poincare plot significantly changes its shape and takes the triangle form, like, like this, triangle form. Uh, uh, or the form of comet. Uh, then the speed spot lightly uh, retains electrodical shape, changing only in size. The early studies of the asymmetry of the speed spot uh, by our, uh, our team showed that uh, as well as uh, for the Poincare spot, they are characterized by an imbalance of acceleration and deceleration process. In this case, the coefficients of degree of imbalance for speed spots are the ratio of the variance of array of points with positive values of velocity and uh, with negative values of velocity to the total variance respectively. In addition, the overall coefficient Asymmetry was determined as the ratio of the above two values. You can see uh, plots uh, in time uh, this uh, uh, variable of uh, speed spot asymmetry. Uh, closer look at this coefficient during an atrial fibrillation attack it showed a sharp surge only at the end of the attack. On it. Uh, this factor can be used as a marker for the presence of an atrial fibrillation event in a pattern. In addition, this, this explains the physician's statistics that characterize the moment of uh, moment uh, of the end of atrial fibrillation as the most likely moment uh, of the onset of a stroke. To analyze the symmetry of the speed spots in the four quadrant interpretation, the data were normalized first. The idea of the normalization was to center the speed spot relative to the origin. For this, the average value of corresponding variable, rhythm of its speed, was subtracted from the obtained data. This presentation made it, made, it, made it possible to formally assess the nature of the asymmetry in the following four types. Q1, rhythm is greater than average and the speed is positive. Q2, rhythm is greater than average and speed is negative. And Q3, rhythm is less than average and speed is negative. Q4, with uh, rhythm is less than average and the speed is positive. Uh, asymmetry was assessed by the number of points of in each uh, of the quadrants for normal and atrial fibrillation conditions for an array of successive windows of uh, 300 failures. Mm. The results of, of uh, this calculation of this analysis are shown in slide six. This is time graph uh, episodes of atrial, before atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation case, after atrial fibrillation uh, case. And it's, uh, this table show as uh, numerical characteristics uh, of uh, this coefficient. Analysis of this data, 
uh, show this an abnormal reason, uh, the distribution of the values of the duration of the RR intervals has a regularly get asymmetry both in absolute value and in the rate of their change. In this case, all the coefficients from Q1 to, to Q4 rhythmically change their sign. And when atrial fibrillation uh, occurs, there is decrease in the amplitudes of change in the coefficients Q1 to 4, uh, which can be explained by a decrease in the rate of cardiac output and a violation of the cyclicity of waves of acceleration and deceleration. Uh, the end of atrial fibrillations is, in, is accompanied by a significant divergence of the Q1, Q3, and Q2, Q4 curves. That is, there is significant asymmetry accompanied by a sign change in both the heart rate parameter uh, and the parameter of its rate of change. And this four quadrant speed spot analysis can be used to, anal to analyze the degree of arrhythmia uh, of interest for further research in the analysis of asymmetry of speed spot for various types of cardiac abnormalities. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Questions from our audience? Yes. Yes, I would like to uh, interfere again. Uh, thank you for your uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, since uh, I was playing a little bit with similar data, uh, in my case was not uh, ECG, it was EEG. Uh, my question is yeah, uh, about, about uh, using uh, slightly different uh, primary methods like uh, recurrence plots and uh, Gramian angular fields. Have you tried this uh, to your data? Because it uh, can, can lead to quite interesting results. Uh, this is just an opinion. I uh, did not try it, only on EEG in my case. Angular uh... Thank you very for your question. Uh, I think this could be uh, really interesting uh, because uh, we uh, have been focused uh, uh, and uh, on the uh, in English. I, I didn't know in English Theory House. Uh, uh, Chaos theory. Of Okay, the chaos theory. Yeah, yeah. Chaos theory. Yeah, uh, it's uh, your Kolmogorov uh, uh, equations. It's uh, almost uh, uh, near the, this theory. Yes, you're right. Uh -huh. But uh, this recurrence and, of course, are connected. Uh, recurrence plots and angular fields are connected, but it's not about Kolmogorov. It's uh, something else. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if you if you tried. Uh, just as uh, a suggestion, you thank might you. find something thank interesting. Thank you for your suggest. Uh, I'll try to use this and found out. I, I think I found out many new uh, items in this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I will present the uh, Internet of Things uh, in the monitoring uh, physical parameters. Uh, the introduction Internet of Things in monitoring physical parameters are you uh, <laughs> the monitoring uh, factors, data request, uh, analyze storage, and data transmission. Uh, the material and method, a basic component of the system, it's uh, the Arduino Nano, Arduino Mega, EQG module, uh, pulse, uh, pulse and uh, sensor, ECP Wi-Fi module, accelerometer, SD card, and uh, the buzzer uh, LED alert, and uh, the display for the information uh, device. The diagram block uh, is to the system a slave data transmitter and the master data receiver is the function. Uh, materials method, uh, the acquisition part of the data from the sensor was uh, resided to 
the microcontroller at mega 320 at mega uh, the material method with the, the SAP module Wi-Fi this module uh, has been the role of uh, transmission data from the patient of the recording system in the cloud I have in the fixed IP uh, travel with uh, the pay, uh, pairing uh, between the uh, master module and the slave module will be performed. Uh, in uh, order uh, to be uh, able to acquisition the processing of the biological signal, EQG, uh, we use uh, an instrumentation amplification uh, together with the analog to digital converter. Uh, first channel is for the displaying the electrocardiogram with the second is uh, for the determining, uh, determining uh, the respiratory function. It is uh, designed to extract and uh, amplify low value biosignal. Uh, the pulse uh, sensor has been uh, used to the collect data about uh, heat a bit uh, under normal condition as well uh, physical effort. Recording data, we will use uh, the separately monitoring the patient, both uh, health and uh, unhealth. It is uh, very useful to record the medical data on the SD card memory. Accelerometer, it can detect the patient movement uh, relative to three axes. The mobility of uh, the three axes is determined according to the position it will take at the time of the calibration. For the patient wearing uh, both visual, acoustic elements where uh, can choose, uh, piezoelectric buzzer was used. On the visual side, uh, a red LED was used the light up to the goes on the different mode alert uh, visual. Oh, Spray OLED is very used to get with uh, the Arduino Uno a development board. The capture information display with uh, the, uh, the, uh, 0, 9, uh, 6 inch diagonal display. Uh, the power supply, the system uh, of the device was powered by uh, voltage change model consummation of the lithium-ion battery with capacity for the complete uh, system as an automatic uh, 8 and 10 hours, the functionality. And the result and discussion, uh, the search code of the system in uh, attending to the functional reality to the acquisition and the processing of a biomedical signal contained. First step uh, of uh, the structure, uh, the code was check uh, each module if uh, it is cor connected correctly. I will present in, in figure 10 search codes uh, uh, system. Uh, and the conclusion, preliminary result has been uh, showed that the device is capable to of the talking in the signal from a uh, TASH module. Development of the such system uh, represents a wide field to, of research that involves both uh, knowledge in the biomedical field and the, the engine field. Opti optimize of the device is ne necessary to achieve a correlation of the real-time data, uh, data, but uh, also patient safety. Uh, thank you for your attention. Ask you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Questions from the audience, please. Okay. So it seems I'm uh, the most active participants yes, in terms yes. of us asking questions. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Robert for uh, this nice presentation. And as a clinician, I know what is the price of getting uh, uh, data on time. And he uh, explained us uh, one of the ways uh, it can be done. Uh, 
Uh, my question is uh, about the use of this data. Uh, have you tried to, to, to uh, elaborate on, on this? Uh, I, again, the, the same old question. Um, first, uh, machine learning used for this, and uh, especially in a clinical setting. Uh, the machine learning uh, in the first uh, step and uh, with uh, the another step was the clinical uh, information for the, the data acquisition. I see. Uh, then uh, can you tell me uh, which are the main uh, machine learning models uh, for, for uh, analyzing and uh, pre-processing the data are you using? Uh, the processing and the, uh, the software processing with the Arduino software develop and the, the show the electrocardiogram graphic. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, but uh, how about machine learning algorithm? Uh, there are a variety of them and uh, many of them uh, simply cannot be applied uh, to this uh, time series data it's quite a problem uh, working with this type of data and not all the machine learning uh, is appropriate uh, or good for for this okay. this uh... okay uh, thank you <clears throat> Thank you, thank you Machine very much. learning, it's a second step. Now it's mm -hmm. uh, about uh, MATLAB and lab view acquisition mm -hmm. and uh, processing. Yeah, you yes, have, I, uh, I agree with you, but uh, uh, this time I'm asking as a uh, practicing uh, physician uh, that would like to get uh, information to be used uh, directly in the decision uh, making process and this uh, is why i am torturing uh, the uh, presenters with my uh, maybe uh, not very appropriate questions but once again i'm a physician and i would like to uh, find out what can i use from this directly in my practical activity <laughs> sorry <We understand>. <laughs> no it's not it's no problem it's a good idea and it's a, this is the future. Machine learning is the future in uh, medical decision. You are, uh, I am a biomedical engineer and I work with a physician. And every day they ask me how to resolve this problem or this problem in a uh, appropriate time. Yes, we will jump uh, higher or not. <laughs> yes, yes, correctly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We greet everyone and we are glad to see you all uh, at this conference. So we are Alex and Oleg and um, we have prepared a presentation of our work. So as you can see, uh, the main subject is uh, development of algorithms for improving currency of search for biomarkers uh, with the results of the uh, computer tomography. Uh, so, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, um, as you can see, uh, the main goal is uh, development of an application uh, for the search for biomarkers limiting the bone orbit, uh, as well as analysis of the benefits obtained from the use of augmentation. So, to simplify, in our life, people often face uh, the problem of long manufacturing and high cost of the eye implants or an operation for prosthesis of the bones uh, or the orbit. So um, practically uh, this happens before uh, because uh, medical workers take a long time uh, to recognize and detect the uh, sockets and eyeballs. Uh, they damage and uh, other various kinds of uh, deviations. So. Uh, the process of recognition and detection uh, can be automated, uh, thus reduce the amount of money and time costs. And our work uh, has to deal uh, with its science as a part of a big application that automate uh, such processes. So, next slide, please. Uh, we are used different technologies such as TensorFlow, Keras, that's uh, a high-level IP for TensorFlow, NumPy, uh, Anaconda environments, <laughs> of course, again, TensorFlow and Python, and also we are using uh, machine learning with uh, NVIDIA CUDA, of course, it's speed up um, machine learning. 
So, uh, first of all, we are preparing images for our neural network, and uh, we're faced with the problem that we don't have enough um, images to train it. So, um, uh, preparing images for neural network learning was done through parallel marking of those and uh, conversation of decom files, images, and so on to GP have been done in advance. As tool for data marking, we uh, used open source uh, VGG image annotator. Uh, so it is uh, very simply open source and uh, there are no any problems with it. Uh, and it is an application for manual annotation of images uh, with ability to carry out uh, multiple markup. And as a result of uh, marking, we have got files in a CSV or, for example, a JSON format uh, that uh, stores information about coordinates in the form points limiting orbital socket. Uh, so, next slide, please. Uh, as you already know, uh, science initial number of images failed to meet uh, minimal weather. Uh, we decided to use different methods in increasing the number uh, of images for learning, such as augmentation, and it was, was the best decision, I think. So. Uh, therefore, we, it was decided to create following types of augmentation and mix it together. Uh, so you can see a list of it. Uh, it is, uh, please begin again. <laughs> okay, this image shift uh, is based on augmentation, um, uh, changing in brightness, uh, and it is also known as bank segmentation. Uh, noise segmentation, uh, like creation of different noises and um, variation of those on whole image and of course, image resolution and image deformation. So you can see examples of uh, uh, types of augmentation now. So it's simply, um, it's simply uh, to understand that uh, the image is uh, simply a matrix. So we can uh, deformate and move it uh, due to mathematical operations with matrix. So next examples. Uh, as you can see, for example, it is deformation and scaling and so on. Uh, and uh, we're using uh, the mixes of them to improve stability and uh, uh, scalability of the images. So next slide, please. Uh, as a result of a neural network learning, uh, we get uh, different ways, coefficients uh, for each layers and so on. And it is uh, uh, th those um, ways uh, are used to find uh, different coordinates of uh, bear markers uh, from the test set and from the training set. As a result of processing of the set uh, with use of training neural network with and without augmentation, we got a dependency of uh, neural network error from uh, exact epoch. So next slide, please. Uh, the slide shows the graphs of learning without using augmentation. As you can see, um, accuracy is about 10 points. And for example, it is uh, 10 pixels on image. And in the next slide, uh, you can see uh, training result with use of augmentation. So you can see that we increase accuracy of model twice uh, to five pixels or five points. So I think that it is a great result uh, with using of augmentation. Um, so, um, in conclusion, uh, in the next slide, uh, we can say that um, the set task and the goals for the software were achieved. And uh, it is established that conclusion uh, bears of the biomarkers coordinate based on biomedical images, uh, result, and computer tomography with the use of neural network segmentation have helped compared to its ordinary learning. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, our contacts are presented on the slide below. Uh, we are very glad to take a part in this conference and we're open to cooperation and welcome comments and suggestions. And also we'll get to continue further interaction with you. So any questions? Okay, thank you for the presentation. Questions, okay. Thank yes, uh, I'm here again. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Oleg for this uh, quite interesting for me presentation, uh, since uh, I'm a little bit uh, familiar with the situation uh, in this uh, field. As, as far as I know, uh, the um, specialists with the images, uh, in fact, are at the uh, leading uh, edge of uh, machine learning, 
uh, used in a practical uh, field, uh, this time for uh, X-ray, CT, and uh, similar uh, analysis. Uh, and my question is uh, similar to the one I uh, posted uh, to previous reporters. Uh, you are mentioning here uh, that uh, you are using uh, neural networks. Uh, can you elaborate or tell us what, what type of networks? Uh, because uh, I have seen that the um, tools you are using is quite impressive. And uh, since you are using NVIDIA, probably you are using uh, GPU instead yep. of CPU, yep. uh, maybe TPU even if you are speaking about TensorFlow. Uh, but uh, t can you tell uh, me uh, which uh, types of uh, neural networks you are uh, using? Of course, of course. Uh, we use uh, commercial neural networks because uh, they are pretty interesting for image uh, processing. And uh, of course, we are using TensorFlow and Keras to simplify developing of the neural network training. Uh, and of course, we are using um, training with GPU because it is increased the speed of training uh, for four, 10 twice uh, per training. And it's uh, really amazing that we are using uh, CUDA because it speed up a lot of uh, training uh, tries and um, yeah, we are using uh, commercial networks as I already said, uh, CNN, and we use some type of flattened uh, layers in the end to get the coordinates of uh, our bare markers. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would like to mention that uh, using uh, uh, GPU uh, probably is quite costly, isn't it? <laughs> Probably yes, uh, but um, we are familiar with the different systems, and we uh, try to using uh, CUDA in uh, Linux because uh, Windows is uh, more difficult uh, in this situation. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so of course, and we are using Anaconda because we uh, have different environments with uh, different versions of our libs, and uh, it's also give us uh, some accuracy. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. And great success. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the presentation. <laughs>